Okay then, so we're recording and uh, let's get started. I'm just going to have a quick look as usual at uh, last week's quiz. Um, where are we? Let me see, do you want that? And it's here, that's the one. Okay, so you've got a couple of people at the top, didn't put uh, numbers and names in. Uh, obviously more practice, no problem as far as I'm concerned, I don't mind. Um, why not? Uh, you can probably, I'll scroll through here, you can see your names and numbers coming up. Got people coming in. Um, if you look at that, you can see that now, hopefully. I'll just slowly screen with her. Got quite a few people doing it twice, that's good. Or more than twice, why not? So you should now be able to see if um, if there's any problem. If you, if if if, you, if your quiz didn't come through to me, and your score didn't come through to me, you should you should be able to tell. I don't think there's any problem though, as far as I can say. Nobody's ever mentioned um, that their quiz didn't come through. It always seems to come through. Uh, occasionally, there's some kind of bug, but you know, it always seems to be there. So I don't think we have a problem. If we do have a problem, let me know. As I say, some people doing it without, you know, just doing a dry run as a practice. That's fair enough. No problem with that. I don't mind. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you could just as easily put your name and number in from the beginning. I'm going to check. I'm going to give you the big, the best score, all right? The best score you get. I'm going to give it to you. So it doesn't really matter. But anyway, you get the idea. So presumably there's no problem there. Okay, and I think the quiz is now up and should be accessible. It's quite easy one today, I think. Okay, right. And uh, let me go back. Okay, and let me just get rid of this. Um, don't want that. Okay, let's get rid of that there. And Microsoft Forms, that's today's. Before we start, let me just, oops, don't want that. Why is that? Don't want that. Get out of the way. Okay, here we go. Eh, why? Doesn't let me do it. Okay, never mind. Uh, why is it? I don't know, it's strange in there. Okay, let's go here. Uh, usual stuff. I just won't let me move. <laughs> Why won't you let me move this? Okay, here you go. Um, ah, yes, the uh, the the magic. Why does it have to be strange? A magic word, this should say. Magic word is. Oh, that's stupid. What am I doing? That's pretty stupid. Sorry, I'm making a mistake. Had a busy, busy week this week. <laughs> God, no, I don't want to do that. Had a busy week this week, and um, I kind of um, forgetting things. Sorry about that. Anyway, it's good that we can actually do this now. So the magic word should be cocoa. You'll get that in a second, right? Um, and that's that. Maybe I should. Just do a little line like that. So it's clear and Coco, K-O-K-O. -K -O. Um, and then you've got the rest of it down there. Let me just look at the preview for a second. Um, okay, people coming in. Quite a lot of people coming in today. Um, let's make sure this is okay. Proof student numbers, no problem. Magic word is like that. Okay, good. Yes, looks all right. We'll check through this later anyway. Um, so we shouldn't have any problem. The problem I have got, okay, here. 
All right, so this is last week's, I think. Yeah, it's last week's. And let's have a quick look through this to see if we've got any serious problems. Murder. Yeah, you get the magic word right. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> of course, people do it. They do it a couple of times and check. It's fair enough. I don't see any problem with that. Um, kick means to hit with one's foot. Yes. I know it's a boring example, but it's an easy, simple, easy to under understand example. Kick means to hit with one's feet. I don't know what feet is it. Kicks to hit with one's feet. I don't like that particularly. Actually, as a definition, I'm not going to accept it. So foot, I think, is the best answer. Um, See when someone loses eyes with one's sight, I think is okay. The rest is not okay. Here means to perceive someone something with one's ear or ears with one's hearing. Yes, I accepted that one, not the others. Uh, murder means to kill someone who either breaks the law. Yes, spelling breaks the laws. I don't think we say that. I'm not going to accept it. Breaks the legal. I don't think so. Legal is an adjective. We could say that something means a sign that is decided in culture and that is symbol okay. um, i'm going to go on about this and i'm going to review this again and again because i think it's quite an important distinction and we will be talking about that today again in fact excuse me and um <clears throat> we could say that tower means to fall down or fall over except both of those and fall collapse no not going to accept that it means to collapse, I suppose, but or it's close to that, but fall down or fall over. Um, Aruku means to walk, yes. Stroll is also given, yes. Move is not, it's like basically move, yeah, I mean, it's part of the meaning of walk, right? And we'll get to this later, right? We'll be thinking about this. What is meaning? You know, what's, what kind of, um, what kind of things are involved in meaning? Right? And the idea of movement is, in fact, involved in meaning, in the meaning of walk or aruku, right? Um, but um, it's, it's more than that, isn't it? It's like, you know, it means to walk. Let's have a look. Linguists might, so in other words, move is too general. Linguists might object to saying that yoma means to read is just a translation. Yes. Yes, a translation from one form to another yeah in other words you don't really get to the meaning it's kind of you know what is what is read means yomu yomu means read read means yomu yomu means it's this circular goes round and round and round and you never get to the real meaning of it and i think that is a serious problem actually with um semantics what is meaning it's a fundamental question we'll try and think about that later I mentioned Richard Montague. He's a famous American mathematician. That's right. He's a famous Montague. Yes, I was called an American Montague, but I'm not going to give that. And it's mathematician rather than mathematics. Be careful. He died in 1971. Great. He died in Los Angeles. Ah, maybe I should allow that, should I? Didn't die in 1947. Ah, but Los Angeles is two words. Yeah, I think I may have given LA as a possibility. I can't remember. Yeah, LA as in like uh, just capital L, capital A, which would be one word, I suppose, la. But I don't, I didn't give that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, he was born in 1947. He died in Los Angeles, but Los Angeles is two words. I'm not going to accept it. 1971 is, is acceptable as one word. Okay, that's the game. Have to have rules. I was only 41. Yeah, I was 41 years old, right? So I think it must be one. Read it carefully, please. He was violently murdered, yes, at his home. I love this story, actually, because Montague is so like, uh, important in semantics. And uh, it's got this really strange story. Um, connected with it. I just think it's really fun. And um, I think there's serious problems with this theory as well, actually. And I think it's had a, maybe in some ways it's had a rather negative influence, but we'll get back to that later. I'm just kind of introducing this idea at the moment. Montague semantics. We'll deal with this a bit more later. 
and he believed there's no real difference between human languages and then you've got artificial machine and formal languages. Yes, they're all okay. Oh, those are good answers. I like those. In other words, you're kind of talking about things like, you know, computer programs. Yeah. If you've got like a, a language which is built to communicate with a machine. And he's basically saying there's no real difference between human languages and those languages, machine languages. Let's see what you think. Um, I think that's a really crazy idea. <laughs> I mean, I want you to think about that, right? It's like, I'm not gonna, I don't want to give you the answer here, right? Um, but this, is, this has, has had a huge influence on modern semantics <clears throat> and, and beyond modern semantics. Also on like Chomsky and linguistics and other forms of, other forms of um, syntax and grammar. Uh, the idea that um, there's no difference between human language and, and artificial languages. And uh, <clears throat> I think there's a really serious problem with that idea. And it hasn't really been, people don't think about it. So I want you to think about that, right? Do you, do you think there's, a, there's no difference? <laughs> there's no difference between a human language and machine language? Really? You seriously think that? Anyway, I mean, like, I want you. To, I want you to think about it. I mean, just, there's no answer here. I mean, you're not going to be right or wrong, but I want you to think about that. Is that is it the same? I don't know. Let's have a look. I got artificial, artificial spelling, right? Spelling, computer languages, human languages and computer languages. Yeah, actually, computer. Maybe I should give that really because it's kind of in the right track. Uh, I might change that actually. Computer, yeah, number seventeen. Computer maybe is acceptable. Computer languages, hmm. Computer code, yeah, kind of. It's, it's not bad, is it? I might change that. Um, you might write the sentence "Bill likes Mary" for a computer to understand the following way: likes Bill, Mary, and then Mary goes in there. Right? I prefer like a small letter here, but it doesn't matter. See, it doesn't give you a tick here. But it is the correct answer. Don't worry about it. Not that. Right? That's too much. Just want one word here to go in. Okay. So that's the biggest problem we have. People doing more than one word for the answer. Um, yeah, look at that. Right. Don't think about that. Does that really give you? I mean, if you say Bill likes Mary, if you think about that, the sentence in a natural language, human language. Right? Think what's involved there. And then you just have this, right? For an artificial or machine language. Is that the same? Right? Think about it. I mean, for, for us, likes has a meaning. Yeah? And the idea of Bill and Mary has meanings, right? And they fit together in that, in a very sort of specific way. Whereas this, likes Bill Mary, right, doesn't seem to have any meaning. The machine doesn't know what that means, right? The machine doesn't know what likes means, really, unless we tell it, give it more information. You know, if we get likes and we get the names of people, we grow up learning that in culture, right? We, get the, we know what likes means in culture. Whereas with a computer, it doesn't know what likes means. Right? Computers are kind of stupid. I mean, computers are amazing in many ways. They're very fast and they speed up our lives. And, you know, you're all using them now. Fantastic, right? But at the same time, they're kind of stupid. They don't know what these things really mean unless we tell them. Anyway, let's carry on. Uh, Mary rather than May. Um, you might rest, gave, John gave Jim a book in the following way. Yes. So this is just an introduction, right? So gave is good. It doesn't give a tick because I entered the first one as a small letter, but it still gives you the correct answer. So don't worry about it. Gives, yeah. John gave. I'm going to stick with gave, actually, rather than gives because, you yeah. know. 
Now then, Charles Sanders Pierce. Uh, again, this is a review, a review from first semester. I've mentioned this before this semester, and I'm also going to mention today a little bit. Um, there are three kinds of signs. The different kinds of signs. That's kind of true. Many kinds of signs. Yeah, by three, right? I want to get that in. Um, he said the different kinds of signs are indexes, icons, and symbols. That's right. Symbols. It says it's indexes, icons, and symbols. Is all I'm going to accept there. An index is a natural sign that points directly to something. Yes, good. Nearly everybody got that right. And the rest of it is just careless miss, it seems. Yeah, like smoke points to a fire. Icons are signs that look like something. I'm going to deal with a little bit more today. Icons are signs that looks like grammatically no. Onomatopoeia are iconic because they sound like something, yes. Bang, crack, right? Things like that. They don't really look like something, I don't think. We'll deal with that distinction today. Because some symbols do look like something. Right? Some linguistic symbols look like things. But onomatopoeia sound like things, right? Not really not really look. Uh, this is not an index or an icon. It does not look like anything. It's, just, it's a tick, isn't it? I think like a tick. It doesn't really look like anything. In, ja in Japan, you didn't, didn't really use that. Yeah. You use more like a maru, right? Um, so it's just agreed on in culture. And for that reason, it's a symbol. Okay, so symbol is agreed on in culture. I want to make sure this is established. The signs used in sign language are decided in culture, so they are actually symbols. They are, they are actually symbols. Yeah, they're signs, right? Actually signs, yes, but you see the point here. They're decided in culture, so they are symbols. Right? Symbols are decided in culture. They don't really necessarily look like anything. Um, there's no natural connection between them. We just decide, right? That something it has a certain meaning. Right? You can say, you know, for example, I can't get my hand to show. It doesn't show it. Oh, there it is. You can say that sort of sign. Um, can't make it show just one finger. It's not good. Say that, right? doesn't really look like anything. It's just agreed on in culture to have a certain meaning of some kind. Uh, maybe a better example is like that, where that might have different meanings in different cultures. Yeah? It means good in Western European and American culture. It means money in Japanese, I think, and has a rude meaning in some cultures. So it's just decided in culture. Words are also decided in culture, so they are also symbols. Yeah, I think we have to agree that most, apart from onomatopoeic words, perhaps, right? Um, for example, the sound made by a dog is bow, wow, or woof in English. And it might be something different in uh, other languages. They're onomatopoeic, so they're kind of, some of them are similar, like a cow's sound. Moo, right? That kind of seems to be every just about every culture has the same kind of sound. So you might say more or moo, but it's kind of close. Right? But most words just could be anything, right? I mean, there's no particular reason that, for example, the word read has that sound. And it's yomu in Japanese. I mean, there's no particular reason for it. It's just decided in cultures has happened that way. And languages are very different for that reason. Referential semantics relates to objects, yes, things, yes, objects and things. Not really objectives, it's a different meaning. What happened here? The word is simple, it's an object and a, I think I've messed up this, 29, I'll check that later. It looks like I made a mistake. I'll come back to that in a bit. Something like unicorn may be imaginary or unreal. 
Yes. Maybe real. No, they're not real. Maybe rainbow. No, I'm not going to give that. Imaginary or unreal is correct. That's what I said in, in the talk. This is an example of cave art. Yes. Cave art. And strangely, cave art um, has lots of um, icons, right? pictures that look like things. Uh, but it also has symbols, it seems, you know, that don't really look like anything. And yet you see these symbols appearing all over the world, right, in very early cave art. And it just seems, where does, where does that come from? It's strange. Right? Incredibly. So why, would, why would cave art in different parts of the world have the same kind of symbols, right, don't really look like anything? Uh, but somehow it seems that in different parts of the world, people are using the same arbitrary symbols. It's incredibly weird. I mean, but I, I might get back to that later, but I mean, you can think about that. Um, some of these Im images are certainly iconic because they look like something. Yes, good. Because they look like something, right? Not looks. Be careful. Paint like something, not really. However, some cave art doesn't really look like anything. It seems to have been decided in culture, so we must consider it to be symbolic. Yes, symbolic, I think, in this case, rather than symbol. Symbols, not really. Signs, no. Symbolic. All right, so cave art is symbolic, right? In the sense that you can have these symbols, things which are just decided in culture. Um, and you've got these symbols. It's very often, it, it seems the same symbols, right? Nothing to do with pictures, not, not icons, right? Symbols, really arbitrary, it seems. There's no particular reason for it, why you'd choose this. And you'd expect these all to be decided in culture. And yet you'll see very often the same symbols being used in different parts of the world, in cave art. It's just extraordinary. What is that? incredibly strange but anyway think about it probably come back to that later and then chimpanzees don't point the way humans do in order to give directions no you understand well that's kind of true but that's not really the point here they don't point yeah so it's like yeah we draw attention to people or you know people's attention to things and point yeah and then we kind of look that way um, and chimpanzees don't do that Dogs do, right? Dogs are really into human culture, right? Their survival, I suppose, depends on getting into human culture. So animals can do this, right? And gorillas, I expect, can do it, but they're just not interested. They don't care about us. Right? Humans, who cares? They're just not interested. Anyway, they don't point. And they don't seem to understand we when we point, yeah. Um, and probably more importantly, they don't care, right? They don't care what we're pointing at. We have, you know, it's not interesting to them, unless they, unless we're giving them food or maybe causing dangers to them. Um, dogs are exceptional, yes, and that they understand our pointing behavior. I'm always interested in people saying about. Um, cats a lot of people a lot of students have cats and they some people suggest that the cat does understand pointing i'm not sure how um, usual that is it's a very interesting question as far as i'm concerned anyway it's dogs rather than bogs be careful please <laughs> bit of a careless miss there and compared to most animals humans are very helpful yes cooperative and helpful that seems to be that seems to be what um makes us different right? we are highly co cooperative animals we're always trying to cooperate with each other um, and of course you know we want to compete and sometimes we will cooperate with other people in order to compete um, but it seems that we're incredibly cooperative more so than other animals and that's not to say that other animals are not cooperative but we are very cooperative it seems um, and if you get people like Michael Tomasello, I might mention him later, I've mentioned him before, uh, he makes this point very strongly, that humans, human behavior, right, what makes humans different 
is the fact that we're very, very cooperative. Uh, how did human ability to communicate, develop, evolve? Yes, how did it evolve? How did evolution know, right? How did it evolve the verb? Develop, not these others, really. Progress. Ah, progress. Actually, progress, I don't think that's bad. I think I might change that. Okay, you'll see me do this in a second. It seems that early humans learned how to control fire and cook. Yes, control fire. And, you know, think about that. You're talking about millions of years, right? Not thousands of years, millions of years uh, before Homo sapiens, like you're talking about, you know, Homo erectus, like uh, our ancestors before modern humans, they were controlling fire, cooking in communities, hunting. Do you think they had no symbols? They had no normal word type communication? Were they not making hand signs to communicate? Think about it. Anyway, um, it seems that early humans learned how to make tools, yes. And boats. Ah, boats. I think I'm going to give that, because I did say boats, didn't I? Yeah, I did say boats. Uh, there is some evidence that Homo erectus actually built boats to, um, to travel around. So if they were able to build boats... Uh, to go long distances, and they wanted to travel. Uh, they intended to travel these long distances. You think they had no language? No signs? No symbols? Fire? Cooking? Cooperative hunting? Building boats? Making tools? They had no signs? No symbols? Is that what you think? That's what Chomsky says, actually. Anyway, think about it. Did cave art come and then before or after humans developed language? So in other words, I suppose you'd say if, if a cave, cave art is showing pictures and symbols, would you expect some kind of language? Maybe one word communication, maybe. Right? Maybe not grammar, but maybe one word, like, oh, monster, danger, watch out, come. Right? It's like single word communication. That seems like a possibility. What's happening here? Is it upgrade? What's going on there? What's that about, honestly? Okay, let me see. I think it's updating. So is somebody doing that now, maybe? It's all right, no problem. Um, I forgot where I am now. Let's have a look. How to develop, develop. David K. Bart, okay. It seems that Neanderthals used painting, paint, paints, yes. Colors, they did use colors, actually. I don't think you use colors in that sense. I don't think I'm going to change that. Yeah. But it, the Neanderthals, in other words, you know, they've disappeared no longer Neanderthals around, um, they used paints, painting their body. And also they painted cave art, it seems. Okay, let me just go out of here for a moment. Can I change that now? Um, let's see if I can go down to 17. Oh, no, it's not good. It's not good. Be nice if I could change this now. Can I change it now? No, I can't. No, it's not letting me do it. Should I do it later? Be nice if I could do it now, though. See, then you, you believe that I'm actually doing it. I don't know why that is. Let's have a look. Let me go over here then. Um, let me just go out of there. Um, it's not letting me 
do this. Ah, it's not letting me do this. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. Let's have a look. Why, why is it always so difficult? I'm panicking now. Sorry. Okay, there you go. No, I bet I can't find it. Uh, so there's today's and there. Okay. That's last week's. Let me just go in here. And I did say 17, right? Let's have a look. 17. Ah, yes, I gave those possibilities, right? Uh, art, the Montague believed there's no real difference between human languages and artificial machine form, man-made. And I think somebody suggested computer. And I think I should give that. Okay, so you can see the different possibilities there. Uh, 29, I think there was a mistake. Let me just check that. 29, 29, 29. Ah, yes. Yes, 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 sorry. Um, this is my mistake. And it should be. I think I'll give this then. Um, why is that not working? Okay. And it's, I think, probably going to be a concept. Concept or idea. Don't worry about it too much. Um, 38. 38. Where are we? 38. How did human ability to communicate develop, evolve, and progress, somebody suggests? Yes. I don't think there's any particular problem with that. The problem is I can't change it. Oh, yeah. Progress. Progress. I think that's all right. And then finally, I believe, 40. Uh, what's happened? It seems the early humans learned how to make. Yeah, I give the picture, so I wanted people to say tools. Um, but at the same time in the talk, I did say that, oops. Okay, here we go. Uh, that uh, these guys, actually, this is Homo erectus as well, that they actually made boats, it seems. Yeah. So, you know, if you think about it, you've got these guys here, right? They're building boats. Um, they, you know, they're thinking about, oh, let's go over, let's go, we've got loads of, you know, miles and miles and miles on the sea. Let's go together on a boat, right? And they build the boats. That's pretty clever, right? And they're making tools, right? And presumably they're using tools to build the boats. So that's pretty intelligent, right? I mean, they, well, I think they have, they have no language at this point. Um, so you're talking about at least half a million years ago. I don't know what you think. I mean, Chomsky says, no, they had no language, nothing, right? Um, I think maybe they had no grammar or not or very limited grammar, but the idea they had no language is, to me, really difficult to believe. I mean, really difficult to believe. But anyway, um, that's that. Let me just come out for a second. So do we have any problems? So look, look at the Okay, so I think we are. I think we're okay. The chat seems to be all right. Okay, now I'll just go back in here, and actually, what should I do? So there's today's. Where is it? Today's. Here we are. And just to remind you again that the magic word is Coco. K O K O you will soon know why that is the case. Okay then, so let's get started. So unless there's any problems, let me know if there's anything wrong, um, any questions. So basically we're kind of thinking about um, fundamental questions about language, you know, what is it, right? Um, and I particularly want you to think eventually about human language, natural language, and 
artificial computer languages. I remember Montague um, saying that there's no difference between human language and computer language. And that's a very, very, art, a very uh, influential idea. And I think we need to think about that. Particularly as many of you, right, many of you will be getting jobs in IT, in, in information technology. Right? Many students take these classes, go on to become systems engineers, for example, work in internet companies and so on. So I think, you know, to consider human language in relation to machine language is very important for, you know, modern students who are interested in language, English, right? The study of English, particularly, perhaps, uh, and using that in the workplace later. So that's a big part of my focus. Uh, it's not just for teachers. Um, increasingly, students are not becoming teachers, and many students have no interest in becoming teachers. And uh, say my Zemi, for example, it seems like just about everybody is going to be working in some, in some sense related to IT. Right? My daughter ended up working in a sort of um, an internet company and so on. It just seems more and more that's happening. So I think we need to think about natural language and artificial language. Is it the same or is it fundamentally different? Modern linguistics says it's the same. It kind of assumes it's the same. And I kind of think maybe that's a little bit crazy. But anyway, let's go through it. What is language? Now, word is a sign. As we said, there are three kinds of sign. You remember this. This is uh, Charles Sanders Pierce's idea. Um, <clears throat> you remember what those are. I'm just going to go through these briefly. Try and remember as we, as we go through it. The first one is going to be, um, the first one is an index. It's a natural sign like smoke is a sign of fire, for example. Okay. That's uh, the first one is an index. This is rather important. And the second one is an icon, something that looks like something else, like a smiley face. And onomatopoeia, uh, you could say bang, crack. They sound like something else. So they're kind of iconic as well. And, you also get, and then you've got symbols, something that's just decided in culture, something like a word. There's no particular reason. You just decide it. Right? And that's a symbol. Okay, so this is like Charles Sanders Pierce's idea, um, but I think it makes sense. It's a nice, easy way to understand what's happening. Okay, then, now if you look at these, these are actually um, Egyptian hieroglyphics or Egyptian hieroglyphs. I can't move this now. Oh, yeah, okay, move down there. Um, Egyptian hieroglyphics or hieroglyphs, as they are often called. Um, how oh, good is that? Oh, I can't move this. Down. What's that then, boss? I don't know why it makes it so difficult for me to move things around. Anyway, here you are. Um, you can see these, right? Now, basically, these, you know, what are these, right? If you look at that, I think straightforwardly, you can see that looks like something, right? Looks like something. Yeah. Um, that looks like something. It's like an eye or some kind of snake or a worm or a slug or something like that and a bird, right? So they're icons, right? They're iconic. I think you'd agree, right? And you're thinking, what's that? Maybe that looks like something, right? What's that? Does that look, does that look like something? And, what's that? and does that look like anything? Maybe, right? So some of them are like clearly icons and some of them are not quite so clear right so it's like it's like you're kind of looking at these icons you think well some of these things are becoming symbols maybe yeah they're kind of moving from this things are starting out as icons and then they're kind of becoming symbols things are just accepted in in a culture so uh, the icons or symbols is really the question there which is it uh, think about it. Um, are they mostly icons? Can I just go out for a second? I just want to make sure I'm recording. Yes, okay, so I am. Okay. Um, it seems like they're mostly icons. I mean, if you look at these things like that, right? these have kind of been redrawn, but it's like, you know, come on. Those are obviously 
icons, right? They look very clearly like something. Yeah. Of course, looking back thousands of years, yeah, to these clearly iconic. But then sometimes you're moving into areas where you think, well, what is that? Right? I mean, it's like it's not really clear what it is. Um, and then things are becoming a bit symbolic. Right? You're moving from icons to symbols in some cases. What is the, what's that? Right? It's not really quite as clear. So um, <clears throat> it seems that sometimes these symbols, which don't really look like anything, um, are starting to develop and just developing in culture. So you're kind of moving, I think, from icon to symbol. And I suppose you could say maybe the same thing is happening in language, spoken language, where you start off with onomatopoeic noises and then these slowly change over time or maybe quickly change over time. Yeah. And then you've got like ancient Chinese kanji, right? Um, where you've got the rather iconic shape, right, is changing, yeah, is changing over time and is actually becoming a symbol. So you can see this kind of, you know, as human beings communicate, you can see this shift from iconic communication. to symbolic communication. And I think that's a nice, easy way to understand things. I think it makes sense if you think in terms of these icons and symbols. Otherwise, it's difficult to explain it. Right? But if you see that, if you think of this shift from icon to symbol, kind of makes sense. So you'd have something like that going on. Right? You have this kind of, I don't know if this is exactly right, right? But, you know, you sort of see in some cases, right, the drawing of the thing is very iconic, a bit less iconic, becomes less iconic, and over time, it's kind of become symbolic, where it no longer really looks like something. Yeah, you can see the same kind of pattern happening here. You're moving slowly or rapidly, I don't know, from the iconic representation everybody can recognize to the symbolic representation we just say okay stick with that now it's easy to draw or whatever right and some things right some things kind of remain very very iconic rather iconic right so it's like even if you get down to the symbol it's still kind of you could kind of guess what that is right yeah can still guess that maybe with these and there maybe that not so easy to guess right but this one you could guess and then this one you could say yeah okay i could guess that maybe yeah this one i don't know if you could guess that i wouldn't right horse i've lost my mind okay horse right um you can see this shift to becoming more symbolic there, I, I wouldn't recognize that as anything, to be honest. Maybe. But anyway, sometimes it becomes very difficult to, uh, to see what it is. And in this case, you can kind of guess, you can see that, that maybe would move that way, like that, right? To that. And if you look at it, you say, okay, I get it. But still, you wouldn't. I mean, somebody seeing that for the first time wouldn't guess. That's a sword, right? And then fish. Is anybody going to guess fish from that? I wouldn't, I don't think. Maybe this one. Yeah. Maybe this one, when you get to the symbolic representation, um, where it becomes fixed, it's still kind of recognizable as something. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, that's what, I think that's basically what's happening. And if you think icons to symbols, right? icons look like things, and then the symbol kind of you losing that iconic it doesn't look like anything but it's fixed in culture you just decide it right and you just decide okay we will stick with these now and of course these are examples which are still fairly iconic 
Right? These symbols are still reasonably iconic, particularly maybe tree, I would say mountain, um, still the gate, right? Still kind of iconic. They're kind of, you can kind of guess those, right? But they are just decided, they become fixed in culture. Okay. And some symbols are more iconic than others, I would suggest. Right. So this one you could probably, if somebody said, what do you, if you say never been to Japan, right? I've never been to Asia, um, say a European or an American person, and you said to them, what do you think that means? Right. Um, and they might say, yeah, you know, tree maybe. <laughs> right. It's possible. I don't know. Right. So it's kind of it's it's a maybe it's a bit more iconic. It looks like something more than some other symbols. Right? It's a symbol because it's decided in culture, but it's a bit iconic. And then when you get things like this, right? And you've got sadness. What does sadness look like? It doesn't look like anything, right? Um, there's no it's it's difficult difficult to think how you could have a symbol or sorry, or rather an icon to show that looks like sadness maybe sounds maybe easier right would look like sadness sound like sadness oh, sad. <laughs> right? but the material that looks like sadness would kind of be difficult wouldn't it? i don't know how you do it right and then you've got this kind of you know you take this this doesn't really look like anything right this bit down here you know, the heart or the spirit kind of thing right and then kind of this kind of sense of it's gone it's not there kind of thing so you get the meaning, but it's kind of, it's symbolic, right? It's no, it's no longer, well, it's never, I suppose maybe it was never, it was never iconic, perhaps. Because how do you, how do you draw a picture of sadness? I don't know, really. Yeah. But anyway, this seems to be very not iconic. Right? This is very, really is symbolic, it's completely symbolic, it seems to me. I may be wrong. So words are just decided in culture, and we're, so words are symbols, right? Words are symbolic is another thing you could say. Okay, now this is cocoa. Remember, say cocoa is the, um, the magic word. Coco, 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 K-O-K-O. It's a nice simple one. And this is cocoa the gorilla. I just want to think about language. And um, we're talking about, you know, homo, homo erectus, half, at least half a million years ago, a million and a half years ago, a long time. Cooking making tools, living in communities, building boats. Did they have words, symbols to communicate? Maybe they didn't have grammar, right? but maybe they did have words. Because, you know, we evolved the ability to speak. But anyway, gorillas don't really speak, of course, we don't think. Never, never, never he actually heard them speak. But Coco actually learned about 1,000 signs, right? Kind of sign language type signs, like, you know, um, you know like, like international sign language, Shua, right? So Coco learned about 1,000 signs and understood about 2,000 words. Um, so as you speak, people speaking to Coco, Coco understood it. And everybody, agrees on that um so these are pretty clever animals you know, they're understanding words they're they're using signs right the gorilla actually using signs right using the hands and making pointing signs they're doing it very very well they wouldn't do this in the wild right but coco learns how to do this while living in human culture essentially so she understood she right she understood nouns um she understood verbs right and she understood adjectives right so in other words all of these grammatical categories she could understand noun she could understand a verb she could understand adjectives so for, in other words you could say she could understand it if you say banana banana is a noun she understood it right um, verbs eat eat is a verb she understood it um, adjectives um, big right big is or delicious right uh, delicious is an adjective she understood it now what was a problem maybe is putting those together right in other words for example eat delicious banana right 
that may be becoming a bit more difficult. All right, but certainly individually, she understood these different things. All right. So the point is that it seems she did understand sounds and words, right? Symbols. Right? She could understand these symbols, but maybe not really grammar. Yeah. Um, grammar became a bit more difficult. Now if you say if you say eat delicious banana, did she understand that? Maybe she did, right? But if you say delicious banana, eat, right? Does she d understand the difference? Is, is that different? That's not so clear, right? So the way you fit words together um, with grammar maybe wasn't really present in Coco. And maybe she couldn't do that. She didn't really understand grammar. Anyway, that's what people think, right? You could argue about it. Um, so putting together, putting words together was not so easy. Right? So she could understand words. She could use signs. Uh, but putting them together and understanding them in combination wasn't so easy. She could do it to some extent, but not, it's not easy. Right? So grammar, ability to use grammar is more difficult. So let's put three words together, for example. All right? Here's an example for you. Door that open. Yeah, door that open. You see, there's three words. Um, now you say door that open. And what's that nonsense? <laughs> right? Doesn't doesn't <laughs> doesn't mean anything. And then you say the open door. The open door. Right? Now that means something. And open the door means something else. Right? But the open door and open the door have very different meanings. Yeah? The open door and open the door. Same words, but very different meanings. Yeah, not completely unconnected. But it depends on the grammar. And it seems like it's human ability to kind of feel this grammar. Right? We're just feeling the grammar. We don't maybe even know what, we don't think about it, we don't care about it particularly, but somehow we just know it, right? Um, and you know, when you're speaking Japanese, for example, you just speak incredibly quickly, um, process huge amounts of language um, very easily, no problem, because you have this grammatical ability and it seems like it's subconscious. Don't even think about it. So anyway, grammar. Same words, but different grammar. Maybe a problem for animals. Humans are very good at this. So in the words, right? Now the words, symbol or a sign. So for example, the symbol would be the sound or the writing. Yeah, sound, you write a word down, it's symbolic. The sound is symbolic, mostly. Onomatopoeic, maybe. Onomatopoeia is iconic, most words are symbolic, just culture. And then you've got the meaning, you know, the concept or the sense of the word, right? So the word has a form and it has a meaning, yeah? And then this actually points to an actual thing, right? So say, for example, you have the word chair, you have the meaning of the word chair, and then maybe a real, a real chair that it points, the word points to. Um, you could have, for example, the word eat. You could have the meaning of eat. And you could have the actual situation of eating, uh, an actual situation where you were eating at some point. So like a real object or a real action. So grammar is syntax. That's how we put words together. Somehow we know how they fit together. You were able to develop this ability. And animals don't seem to be able to do that. Somehow we know how these words are organized. Right? The book. We know that is a noun phrase. 
kick the ball. We know that is a verb phrase. So you've got something like this, the ball, right? We know that is the ball, right? But it's not just two words. It has organization. So in other words, that's the, the determiner or specifier, same thing. Determiner, go with determiner. And ball, which is a noun, yeah? And then we think, well, what's the ball? Well, that's a noun phrase, yeah? That's a noun phrase. Now you think, okay, that's easy, right? It's not particularly interesting. That's a noun phrase. But we know that, yeah? We know that subconsciously. And say, for example, second language learners like you guys, you seem to know this, no problem. Right? You get this, that these things are organized in that way. It doesn't cause a problem. We know it without thinking about it. Animals don't seem to know this. They don't seem to get it. That seems fundamentally what's different between us and animals. Subconscious, subconscious ability. We don't think about it. We don't really, we don't really, um, we're not aware of it. Right? It's subconscious ability to figure that out. You could say it's a determiner phrase if you want. Some people do, but I don't think it's a particularly interesting solution. Noun phrase. You could say specify a phrase if you want, but noun phrase is good enough. Right? You know, it's something, one more than the other. The noun phrase is more like this one than this one. Yeah? more like this one than this one. Somehow we know that. So kick the ball, for example, this is a verb, this is a noun phrase, and we know that this is gonna be more like one than the other. It's gonna be more like this one, and it's gonna be a verb phrase. Yeah, so this whole bit is more like this side, and this helps us organize language. We can figure out language because of that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's it. That's, what's the, that's the big difference between us and animals, it seems. We just somehow, we feel this. We don't, nobody has to explain it to us. Right? We just get it as kids. Human beings just know. We can just feel it. Very strange. How do we know that's the mystery, right? How, we, how did we develop this ability? How did we evolve this ability, I suppose? Anyway, the word, word is a sign, um, and it connects to a thought and the idea of the word and also connects to a thing. The word ball, the idea, the concept of a ball, and an actual ball, for example. Sign, the word ball, thought, or the idea of a ball, and the actual ball, the thing itself. All right, so again, we've got these threes. Right? Very often with language, it seems it comes down to threes. Okay, and you know, it's like this is a kind of magic in a way. Right? This, we, human beings develop this ability, right? Um, and it seems really important to humans and makes this clear distinction between human world and the animal world. So language is creation. You get this idea. Left language is creation. Hindu myth. Right? God wanted to speak. And God said, Bleh. <laughs> Bleh. <laughs> And the earth was created. Uh, that's Hindu myth. Indian language. Right? God creates the world by speaking. Speaking is the act of creation. He said, Buva, And space was created. It said Suva and the sky was created. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. So it's creation. The universe is created with words. Um, and the Bible, in fact, you know, the Bible says in the beginning was the word. First words of the Bible in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. So God had the word. And the word was God, right? God is a word. Yeah, God is a word. Creation. Right? 
the symbol which creates the idea and the actual thing. Right? It's like the word creates the symbol, the form creates the idea and the actual thing. Very strange. Very strange. Think about it. Anyway, um, let there be light, for example. Let there be animals. This is in like the Bible, right? Let there be sea. I haven't read the Bible very much, but I think, I think that's right. If you have read the Bible and you think I'm wrong, let me know. I don't know much about the Bible, to be honest. And so on. Yeah. And you see this kind of same kind of thing, not just in the Bible, but, you know, in Harry Potter, magic spells, expecto patronum, where you kind of create something by using the words. So language is creation, creating this strange animal form. Um, the de again, the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, the Declaration of Independence creates a principle of equality. We're all equal because of this declaration. We declare it. We just say it. We hereby say this. Uh, it happens, creating a principle. Uh, I hereby name this ship Johnny, for example, you create a name. Yeah. So we still have this idea of language as creation, it's very deeply embedded in culture. I hereby declare this meeting open. You create a situation. Right? So you can create a thing, you can create a name, you can create a situation. In a way, that's a bit like language, right? Verbs create situations. Nouns create things. Wow. Anyway, you've got the word horse, the meaning of horse, the actual horse. The word horse, the meaning of horse, the actual horse. So there's three things there. There's the word, the form of the word, the sound or the writing the meaning of the words and the actual thing itself that it points to. So you can actually point to an actual horse in this case, in this sense. Okay, then. And then if you look back 330 to 35,000 years ago, you have these icons which create things and in fact create situations as well because you can see they seem to be hunting or something going on here. Arrows flying around and stuff like that. Are they going to eat this horse maybe? I don't know. It's a sign anyway. It's a picture. It's an icon. It's a picture of a horse. And it, it kind of invokes the idea of the horse. From this picture we get the idea of the horse. And maybe you think of an actual horse. Maybe there was 30,000 years ago, there was an actual horse that this was being referred to, perhaps. It can, it's possible anyway, right? So what comes first, right? What comes first? Do the pictures come first? Or words? I think, you know, back, I don't know, 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, we're thinking that humans starting to create images, pictures, were they already speaking? Did they already have grammar? Think about it. This is Chomsky. He says grammar is needed before we can make real pictures. So he thinks grammar comes before everything. It's his idea. Right, it's up to you, whatever you think. What's the difference between a picture and a word? Yeah. Let's make a model of a word here. Right? Don't worry too much about this, but I'm going to run these things past you over time. Let's make a model of a word. Right? Here's horse, for example. There's the phonological information, horse. So these are all packages of information. So the sound is kind of package of phonological information horse like that something like that then you've got the in the middle you've got the meat the uh, the grammar the syntax and that would be the category for example of the words and the valency right? and i'm going to mention this valency is what something needs or wants it's quite important actually 
Um, the category is going to be, yeah, so valency is, is, is what the word needs or wants. Uh, don't worry too much about this. I'm just going to run this past you a few times over the next few weeks, and eventually, hopefully, it'll stick. The category of the word horse is a noun. This category is noun. It's a noun. And it needs something. Horse needs something in English. It needs a determiner or a specifier. You have to say the horse or a horse. It needs it, right? So it's valency is what it needs. So that's the syntactic information, basically. And then you've got the meaning information, semantics. Right? Semantic information. What's that? Well, that's the mystery. Yeah, that's where the mystery is. You can identify an actual thing. Right? You're able to talk about an actual horse. Right? But you also have the general meaning of horse. Right? Horsiness. Right? If I say horse, you kind of have this idea, this general idea of horse. I can point and say, a horse, there's an actual horse or a picture of a horse, an actual thing. But I'm also, you also, if I say horse, you get this general idea of horse. Right? So you get the, an actual thing that you can point to, an identity or reference, and the general meaning of the thing in, in semantics. So it's going to be something like this, right? You're going to have the ID, the identity of the thing, and the general meaning. Don't worry too much, right? We'll, we'll do this again later, so don't, don't worry too much. I'm ask a couple of little easy questions in the quiz. Index is going to be something, right? Who knows? Something. Right? Some individual, some thing, ID, some horse, an actual horse of some kind. Maybe that horse or this horse or the horse over there, the horse we saw yesterday, some horse. Right? Could be anything. Right? Doesn't matter how we say it, some horse or other. Right? And usually when we, if we think in English, we say this third person singular. A horse walks. Right? A horse walks. It's third person. It's not me. It's not you, it's somebody else, and it's singular, it's a horse, right? And then you've got something like that, and then you've got the frame, which would be the general meaning, right? This is the way that uh, they do it in computer science. The horse frame is like that. So the general meaning of horse, and then the entity, the thing itself, is kind of inside there. And this is the same thing, like the same individual. Anyway, don't worry too much. Right? And X is actually third person singular, normally. Okay, so that's a model of a word, right? Don't worry about it too much. Um, so a picture is a sign and the meaning of the idea of horse, for example. The word is a sign, um, gives the meaning of the idea of the horse. And anything else? Well, a picture gives form and meaning. Form and meaning. Form and meaning. And a word also gives form, the sound or the writing and the meaning anything else yes with a word you also get okay so there's the sound the meaning of the idea of horse for example and you also have grammar right so a picture doesn't have grammar a word has grammar okay so that's the big difference we have grammar human beings have grammar so here's the question what comes first the picture or the word the picture or the word? What comes first? Humans can draw pictures. Humans can make words. Which comes first? I don't know. Have a think about it. Here's another question. Animals can learn words. Chimpanzees can learn words. They're very good at learning words. Dogs can learn words. They're very good at learning words. Everybody knows that. But we think animals don't know grammar. Yeah. It seems, you know, we are good at grammar. They're not very good at grammar. We get it. We feel it. They don't. So what comes first? A word with grammar or without grammar? Yeah. Do you need grammar to use a word? If you just use one word, do you need grammar? So Homo erectus, a million and a half years ago, building boats, living in communities, hunting, controlling fire, cooking their food, cooperating in hunting, 
Do you think they may be using single word communication? Maybe signs and words to communicate? Did they need grammar at that point? Did grammar slowly emerge later, maybe? Anyway, think about it. In the beginning was the word. Did it have grammar? <laughs> anyway, first modern human. Let's say this is Homo sapiens, right? He lived in Africa a long time ago. Something like that, right? Let's say he made the first word. Doesn't matter what it is. Maybe he just came up with bleh, like the word, right? Word which has a meaning. Let's say he made a word like horse. It's the first word ever. There are no other words. Right? There are no other words at this time. It's the first word. Does it have grammar? And you're thinking, are you stupid? <laughs> and you think, I don't know, what do you think? First word ever, does it have grammar? Think about it, I don't know, it's up to you. It's a sign, right, it has sound. It's a symbol, he just decided it. He just decided it in culture. They start using this word, they got one word. It has meaning, it has the idea of horse. It's not a sign, if it's not a sign, it has no meaning, right? So it is, it is a sign, right? But it's not, you know, it's not, if it's not a word, right? But a word doesn't need grammar, right, it seems. Just have a single word doesn't really need grammar. So his, his first word doesn't need grammar, it seems to me. Right? I don't know, it's up to you. What do you think? There's a first word ever that human beings ever create. There must be a first word, right? There must be one first word. So somewhere, do you need grammar to have a word? I don't know. So here's the question. What comes first, the picture or grammar? The first word or grammar? And Chomsky says, He's the cleverest person. <laughs> right? He's the cleverest person in the world, supposedly. Right? He says universal grammar was built into human brains. Right? So universal grammar, all the grammar rules you need, was built into human brains before the first word. Okay. Anyway, that's basically what he says. Before the first picture. Before, before human beings started making pictures, before they started making words, they needed to have universal grammar built into their brains. Anyway, that's his idea. So imagine these guys, human beings, say half a million years ago, a million and a half years ago, a long time ago, before modern humans, they're using fire, they're using tools, like animals do use tools sometimes as well. But early humans are more advanced, right? At least this is like 400,000 years ago, at least, right? Were people thinking? Were they just like animals? It seems like they had culture, they were cooking, living in communities. They could think. Look at that. Can you make that without thinking? Seems pretty clever to me. I couldn't make that. Animals can't do that. Look at that. That's amazing if you ask me. You're talking about a long time before modern humans. This is 3.3 million years old. No words at that point? Nothing? Way before modern humans way before human language. But did they have no language? And no pictures, nothing like that at all? No symbols at all? Anyway, Chomsky says we need grammar. I'm going to stop there because, you know, this is the point. Uh, modern linguistics says we need grammar before we can really think. I don't know. It's up to you. And it kind of relates to the idea about language and artificial language, computer language, machine language. Is it the same? All right, human language and machine language, are they basically the same as, Chom as, um, Chomsky, as Montague suggests? 
as Chomsky agrees, basically, right? are they basically the same? Look at these tools. You think there's no real thinking going on? Why people are making these tools? And sometimes pretty amazing stuff. A long time before human beings. Seems like thinking was going slowly better. All waiting for grammar. So anyway, this is Chomsky says, he says, we needed grammar to make signs. Okay, I think I can stop there, actually, guys. I think I've got to the main part of what I was going to do. So um, that's that. So I'll put that up on YouTube immediately. Let me just check the chat here. No problem, I think. I think everybody's all right. So I'll give you a bit of time to get started on the quiz. It's quite, it's quite an easy one, actually. Right? But some quite important questions. Okay, guys, so if there's no questions, um, I'll see you next week, I believe. Don't forget the quiz. Uh, yeah, don't get fall too far behind with the quizzes. Try and do them um, as soon as possible, I guess. Okay, guys, so I'll say bye-bye. Bye-bye. We're down to nine. Anybody got any questions? Maybe not. Maybe just people are making coffee or something. Okay. Oh, eight. So last chance there, guys. If you've, got, if you've got a question or comment or anything. No? Okay, then, guys. Right, that's that then. So I'm going to close that down and put the recording up very soon. Okay, see you next time. Bye-bye.